Hey, welcome back folks. We're working on our candle box. This is episode two. Last time we were here, we managed to find this board perfectly flat on the uh, side we wanted it to sit on. And it hasn't changed in the time that we've been gone, so we'll just have right at it. It looks like the grain is running this way. I already showed you that, so I'm going to secure this between the dogs. Not too tight. You don't want to add any distortion as a result of putting too much pressure on that uh, with the vise. Okay, I'm using the scrub plane. You saw how far the blade is out. Now I don't have to take off a whole lot on here. I've got about 3 16 of an inch to remove, so I'm actually going to reset this. I'm going to bring that blade in a little bit. I don't need that heavy of a cut. And then Frick, I'm going to get you to uh, just show them again with the white background. Can you see that? Yes, I can. Projection right there. Okay. All right, let's go. Being pine and being straight grained, I can go the full length. If the grain was changing direction on me or on hardwood, oftentimes I'll go across the grain and do something we call a controlled tear. But I'm not getting any tearing of the surface, so I'll continue with this and just kind of watch those lines that I did as a general reference. When I get close, I'll stop and finish this with that four plane I have sitting there. Now I'm just going to eyeball this and that looks pretty good. I don't see any severe dips or no corners. Okay, <laughs> set this aside. I'm going to go over and sharpen this up. I'll walk you through that process. So come on over here to the sharpening station. I keep my sharpening station at the end of my bench. It's convenient. I'm never more than a couple of steps away from having a sharp chisel or plain blade. And I'll explain this in greater detail on one of the other segments, but I'm using Shapton stones. I think they're the best. I've got a 1,000 grit and a 16,000 grit. I've got two holders so they don't have to switch back and forth. Figured that one out a while ago. Just spritz these. You don't have to uh, keep them soaking. This is a lapping plate. It's a diamond glass lapping plate. I'll start over here on the uh, fine stone. And when you bring it back to being white, it only takes a few seconds, you know it's back to being flat. You can see how fast... It's really not so much how fast the stone wears. It's how accurate the lapping plate is. The slightest little bit of wearing shows up. Okay, keep this lapping plate from having that slurry dry on there. If you do, it clogs up these grooves and really slows down the cutting. Every once in a while I've got to come in and scrape all that stuff out. I'm not going to do it today. All right, I'm using an IBC blade. Great blade, comes flat. You don't have to do anything on the back other than the ruler trick. Keep the stones lubricated. I usually put, uh, or I often put a little bit of soap, dish soap in the water and it just gives a little more lubrication. Doesn't seem to hurt the stone at all. So there's my primary bevel, 25 degrees. You can see the little polished strip. I'm going to introduce a secondary bevel and a tertiary bevel. I'm going to do the secondary bevel on the 1000 grit stone. I'm going to do it by holding the blade like so. I have four fingers right out here in the cutting edge. Squeeze my thumbs together so that the two hands operate as one. Set it down on the primary bevel and it's a large enough bevel that you can easily locate it. Raise up three or four degrees off of that primary bevel. Do these little circles. I'm locking my wrist and my elbow and my hands. The pivoting is coming from my shoulder and because it's low enough I can just rock heel and toe over the stone so I'm not working one area. Not introducing a separate motion to my shoulders. I'm just doing these little circles. It usually takes about 10 seconds to raise a slight burr on the back side of the blade, <clears throat> excuse me. I can feel it, I'm gonna go just a little bit heavier than that. Another few seconds. As Soon as you get that burr, providing you've had constant even pressure with your fingers, if the burr runs corner to corner like that does, then I know the edge from there to there is perfectly straight because that stone has been flattened. Now, in doing that, it means that when I come over to this fine stone, 
and I set the blade down again on the primary bevel. I'm going to raise it up this time a few degrees higher than I did over here in the 1000. That means that only the very leading edge will be touching the stone. And I'm going to do something called a tertiary bevel or a third bevel. And I can do that just 10 seconds of work on this very fine stone because only the very leading edge is actually touching the stone. After 10 seconds, I'll treat the two outside corners. I'll show you how I do that. Okay, right about now, I'm going to put downward pressure on one corner for about three seconds. Then I'm going to change and put downward pressure on the opposite corner for about three seconds. And what that does, it creates a very light feathering effect on the outside corners, and that prevents me from having plane tracks when we do a large panel. Set the steel rule down. This is a Charlesworth ruler trick and uh, lay the blade down, work within a quarter of an inch of the opposite edge. This blade's been done before, so the uh, back bubble's already on there. This is just a matter of removing the burr, if there was any left at all. Wipe off the moisture. My normal sharpening time from disassembly, sharpen, and back to working is under a minute. So you can get uh, really quick at this. And the advantage of that and the advantage of having everything already set up is just when it's that convenient, even if you're lazy, and I tend to be sometimes, it's so quick and painless to do, you'll do it. So instead of working with a blade that is well past where it should have been resharpened, I never do that. I'm always working with that pristine edge that gives you such a beautiful surface on the wood. Okay. Make sure that the face of that frog is nice and clean. In case you're wondering, this is a Wood River number six. This is the new version three. And uh, for the money, you can't beat them. Great plane. I actually had something to do with it. I was hired by Woodcraft to help improve them. So if you want to call that a disclosure, there you got it. I'm not paid anything beyond that. Just for the time that I was involved in actually uh, making those changes. Okay, I've sighted down the sole. Actually, Frank, you should get over my shoulder and have a look. I'll show them exactly what I'm doing. When you're sighting down here, what you want to see, I'm going to advance the blade so that it shows up. Now, what I want to do is make sure that that blade is parallel to the sole. I'll use my lateral adjustment lever, which is behind the blade, to skew it one side or the other. This appears to be parallel, so I'm going to leave it right there. And I'm actually going to leave it at that much projection because of the surface of what I'm about to work on has fairly rough texture from the scrub plane. Under normal circumstances I would have retracted that blade all the way and started with the blade tucked inside and then as I started planing I would have gradually brought it out a little bit more and more until uh, I got it to cut and could prove that it was cutting all the way across the ridge of the plane. Okay, full length stroke. Speed this up. Right now I just want to get rid of the deep gouges left from the scrub plane. So I'll watch to see when I get a full width shaving all the way across. Taking a fairly heavy cut. As I get closer I'll bring that blade in. There's no uh, gouges left from that round blade on the scrub plane. A little wax to reduce the friction. Now I'm just going to sight down here. Now by eye, that looks pretty good. Maybe a bit of a hump in the middle. So <clears throat> I'm going to get rid of that hump now before I even put the winding sticks on here. I'll show you what I'm doing. I'm going to draw some lines on here. You plane a board and you will eventually end up leaving a convex surface. Don't know why, that's just the way a plane works. So what I'm going to do is create a concave surface and then as I, as I go back to getting ready for that final finish with the plane, I'll carefully do it so that I go from concave just before convex, obviously it's going to be flat and that's where I need to stop. So what I'm going to do right now is come in here and just take short passes, lifting the plane off. Get the plane skewed so that the length of the sole is allowing me to do this. 
You can see I haven't touched back here or up here. I'm just creating a bit of a hollow in the middle. And with each pass, I'll go back a little bit further. Maybe actually come in here and take another one out of the middle. One more before I go full length. Okay, now I'm going to make full length passes. I'm feeling with my left hand just to see where the overlap is. Oh, that stuff is beautiful wood. Absolutely gorgeous. Okay, now I'm going to grab my winding sticks. And if you've never used winding sticks before, they're nothing more than a couple of pieces of, uh, well, I like to use straight grained quarter sawn lumber, dark. And these two pieces are uh, have parallel edges. And all you're using them to do is exaggerate any wind or twist. So I set one on one end with the uh, white tips and one on the back side. Now, if there's any wind or twist in this board, it's going to be exaggerated by these 20 inch long pieces and you'll be able to see it. The first thing I wanted to determine is whether or not the board is relatively flat, meaning I don't want it pivoting in the middle. And that looks pretty good. Now this is pivoting in the middle, which tells me that I've got a bit of a hump. I can't get as accurate a setting as I could, as I want. So I'm gonna go back in, and I'm going to attempt to get rid of this bump in the middle. So I'm gonna straighten my plane out. I'm gonna take a path right down the middle. I'm going to take another one, then I'm going to step off to my left, I'm going to step off to my right. I've got a plane track there, so I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to retract the blade a little bit more. Alright, that's good enough for what I want to do right now. I'm always make sure that there's no debris underneath your winding stick or on your, on your uh, surface. I'm going to take the pressure off that the, the device has put on because I don't want to distort the board. Now I'm going to put something dark in the background just so that as I sight down here. Now this is hard to pick up on the cam with the camera. But you get behind me, Frick, and look down there. Okay, I'm sighting along the front edge and I'm comparing it to the back edge. And as I lower myself down, those two white corners are eventually going to disappear. Ideally, they should disappear at the same time. That would tell me that the board, that surface is flat. But it's not, they're not disappearing. The one on the far right is disappearing first. So that tells me that I have a high corner here and here. In other words, the winding sticks are sitting like this. Now, you may think, well, how do I know I don't just have a low corner out there? It's almost always you're going to have two low corners and two high corners. Very rarely you're going to dip off of one. So working under that assumption, I'm going to go ahead and I'll put some lines on the board so that you can see what I'm doing. I just have that larger piece in back just because it makes it easier to see the uh, white tips up against the dark background. Put the pressure back on, make sure it's sitting flat. So this is high and this is high. What I'm going to do is I'm going to plane from corner to corner. Okay, I'm going to do it again. I'm planing straight. I'm holding the, bl the plane in the exact direction that I'm planing. I'm not skewing it one side or the other because I don't want to have the plane body read the other sides of this board. Now I'm going to step off to my left just a little bit. I'm going to step off to my right a little bit. I'm going to come back and go corner to corner. What I'm attempting to do, if you can imagine this, is create a new flat that's going to start corner to corner and then spread out to get to this low corner and this low corner. Kind of a trial and error at this stage. Go down the middle, then step over a little bit. Step off to the right a little bit. Do it one more time. Now, I don't want to go too far, so after I do it this one, I'm going to come in and recheck it with the winding sticks. I've gone one step to the left, and then another. Then I'm going to go to the right, and another. Now I'm going to go full length. You're wondering, I always clear my throat out just because I find if I don't, sometimes the shaving gets pulled underneath and stuck on the bottom of the plane. 
and it's a bit of a hassle to have to stop and scrape it off. All right, check and make sure the winding sticks are clean. Okay, they're not pivoting bad. This one is. So, as I did before, take one quick pass right down through the middle to get rid of any high spot that might be there. Take another one, and then off to my left, off to my right. I'm gonna pull the blade in a little bit more. I want much finer shavings at this stage. We're getting really close. Let's check that. Okay, that's good. That's good. Put the dark background in, take the pressure off. Sight down here. Okay, Frick. All right, that's really close, but it's not there yet. We're still a little bit high, so at least I didn't go too far in the opposite direction. Just a little bit. A couple of passes should do it. What we're creating here is our reference face. This is the surface that the other surfaces are going to be referenced off of. This one has to be right. If it's not, then it's going to throw off all the others. Keep the sole waxed. It reduces the friction. And your effort is spent pushing the blade through the wood instead of pushing the plane over the wood. Corner to corner. A little bit off to the left. A little bit off to the right. I'm going to go one more. Corner to corner. A little bit off to the left. Second one off to the left, so I've got all the way to this low corner, or what should be low corner. Now, full length. Feel for where the overlap is. Okay, check and make sure that the winding sticks are sitting flat. That's not bad. Yeah. For some reason, we're forever leaving a bump here. I want to get this right, so take a pass down the middle. Set the blade just a little bit. Not bad, but was, shaving was coming out a little bit heavier on the left than it was on the right. I'm always feeling for that overlap mark with my opposite hand. That'll work. That won't. Gotta get it right. starting to bother me. Got to get rid of this bump. I'll make it worse on purpose. In other words, I'm going to do the same thing side to side as I did lengthwise when I created that hollow. Now I'll take pass off to the left and the pass off to the right. Drop in, take the pressure off the bench. Well, we're still not there. I've still left those corners high. I didn't take off enough. Let's get at it. Must be out of shape. Make sure that's laying flat. I'm going to bring the blade out a little bit more. Corner to corner. Another one. I'll keep doing that until I'm no longer picking up any wood. Then I know I've got to take a pass off to the left and off to the right. And back corner to corner. Another pass off to the left. Pass off to the right. I'm purposely avoiding these very low corners. Or the extreme corner, which happens to be low. I guess would be a better way to say it. Now I'll pull the blade in a little bit. Go full length. It's 
see how that winding stick rests on there. That's not bad. That's not bad. All right, take the pressure off. Let's check this again. Well, in my haste, I did the exact opposite. Now we're high on the opposite corners. I gotta remember this is only a half hour shot. I'm gonna spend the whole time trying to get this one reference face down. One in a corner, opposite time, opposite side this time. Off to the left, off to the right. Corner to corner. Right now you're saying, why don't you just go over to the joiner and be done in two seconds. Yes, it would, but no more near as fun. I love the frustration. All right, let's check that. High spot in the middle. Now this is with a board that's about four inches wide, so you can imagine what this process would be like with something 12 inches wide and six feet long. That blade seems to be cutting just a little bit heavy on the left. So I just push the uh, lateral adjustment lever toward the right side which will pull the left side in. Right, check that. That's better. That's better. Take the pressure off. Fine over there. You want to check that? <coughs> See if you can catch that. Just drop down until they finally disappear. Okay. Did you ever think we'd get there? I had you worried, didn't I? All right, my winding sticks, by the way, if you want to make your own. I have two little dowels on here, and this is just to try to help keep them straight when they're not being used. Uh, I used a piece of walnut, quarter sawn. I have little uh, finger recesses on either end, and that's just to help pull them apart. Sometimes those dowels get sticky. This is just the traditional way they were made. They're heavier in the bottom, narrow in the top. That's why the, the shape is the way they are. Makes them a little more stable in their upright position. I have this little die. I use uh, Corian, by the way. I used to use uh, I used to use uh, Holly, but it would yellow over time. Whereas the Corian stays brilliant and white. The center dot is the center of the winding stick. I want to put the center of the winding stick on the center of the board. Pretty hard to guess two centers if one isn't marked. So you can easily do that. That's the only thing you need to know about them. When I make mine, I actually make them and sell them, but I cut them out. Rough them out. I lay them, sit, let them sit in an upright position for six months. Go back and reshape re the the bare wood or the rough stock. Anything that is twisted, I get rid of. But uh, so when I'm, when I actually make them, they tend to be quite stable. And I soak them in a tub of oil overnight, so that gives you a pretty good finish, pretty protective finish. That's your winding sticks. All right, next thing we're going to do is straighten an edge on this. I'm going to use my uh, long shooting board. I have several of these. Probably the most beneficial shot made apparatus ever invented. What it does is it holds the workpiece and the plane at right angles to each other. I'll talk to you. Um, in one of our next episodes of some of the design features of it. But 
I just want to get at this and get it done. I want to square up. What I want to do is straighten and square this edge to the reference face. And I'll go ahead and just mark that so that you know that that is my reference face. I'm using the plane on its side. And this is almost not quite long enough. I'm having to do a bit of a balancing act at the very beginning. I want that blade out a little bit more because I've got a fair bit of stock to remove. Now, the shooting board is not designed to square this long side to the end. There's just not enough reference surface out here. All I'm doing right now is using the shooting board to hold the workpiece and the plane square in this direction. I'm actually using the sole of the plane to straighten the edge. That's why you'll notice that my left hand pushes the board into the plane and I move it along so that it enables this long surface of this plane to do its job, which is to straighten the edge of this board. I still got a low spot right there off of the handsaw. And I've got lots of wood, so I'm not worried. All right, that looks good. So now I've got an edge that is square to here. I don't have to check. I will check it, but I don't have to because my shooting board, which I made, should already be square. Hold that up to the light. It looks great. You see that? Okay. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to square up the ends. I'm just, for convenience sake, I'm going to grab my shorter shooting board. I'll hold the good face down, the straightened edge against the fence. Now what I'm going to do is simply square across the end. However, I run the risk of breaking fibers out here. So before I do that, I'm going to turn this over, hold it on an angle, meaning pulling it away from the fence, and I'm going to cut a chamfer on this side. Now I'll flip it over. Now, Frick, you need to come over and, and look over my left shoulder. What I'm going to do is work on this until this little chamfer disappears. So there's what I'm dealing with right here. So I'll go ahead and plane. Just be careful as I get toward the end. When that chamfer disappears, if I go too far, I'm going to break fibers off anyway. But you can see in the end of this board, that little surface right there, that is still the chamfer that, that I did. Well, I almost went too far, but that's good. So that end is squared up. Now, this piece is going to be cut in half because it's going to be the, bo the bottom and the top. So for right now, I'm just going to square the two ends and I'll worry about doing this after. Um, okay, now this one. Now this one's actually I'm not going to be able to do because I need to have this edge squared first, straightened first. So, uh, let me think. We don't really have a set width on this piece yet because this is going to be this is going to be the top and the bottom and they're going to be just a little bit different. So I'm going to leave this one at this stage. I can come back in and finish it when we get a little bit closer. On our next episode I'm going to come in and I'm going to do the two side pieces, the two end pieces, and hopefully we'll move this a little faster along than that first one. I usually don't have that kind of trouble getting that first reference face flat. Alright, so we'll see you back here quite soon.